So bonjour tout le monde. Uh, on a uh, 25 uh, personnes maintenant et uh, on a quorum. So uh, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Uh, this is PAFSO's uh, 25th, or sorry, 55th annual general meeting. Um, and before we get started, um, I would just like to acknowledge, could I have the, the next slide please? Acknowledge that we, I am chairing this meeting from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people, and we acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. I would also like to ask everybody to uh, take a moment to remember that um, our colleague and friend Michael Kovrig has now been imprisoned in, a, in China, unjustly detained in China for 686 days. Uh, he's not able to be here with us today for that reason, obviously. He and fellow Canadian Michael Spavor are uh, dealing with some very difficult uh, conditions right now, coming up on, on two years of detention. And um, I ask you to remember them and, and spare, spare a thought for, for Michael, who, who can't be here with us. Before we get started on, on the actual agenda, I'm just going to turn over the floor to uh, Eric Schallenberg, our communications officer, who is serving as our uh, coordinator for, for this meeting and ask him to explain a bit about the format. This is the first time we've ever done this on Teams. And so Eric will just explain to you how the meeting will run. So Eric, can I just turn over to you? Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Um, so yeah, there's a few technical points about the meeting that I need to let everybody know about. Uh, il y a quelques consignes à propos de la réunion. Uh, premièrement, pour uh, éviter des problèmes de connexion, veuillez vous déconnecter de toute source VPN. So if you can please disconnect from any VPN sources in order to participate, this will avoid uh, connectivity issues. Uh, ensuite, pour que la réunion se déroule bien, tout le monde, autre que nos présentateurs, seront mis en sourdine pendant la durée de la réunion. So, other than our presenters, everybody will be on mute uh, during the meeting. Uh, but you will be able to ask questions about the specific presentations using the chat function in Teams. You can type in your questions and we will pass them along to the speaker after their presentation. Uh, il y a un icône chat dans la barre au centre de l'interface Teams. Uh, vous pouvez poser vos questions uh, par l'intermédiaire du chat. On va essayer de garder les questions spécifiques à chaque présentation et on va les répondre uh, à la fin de, de chaque présentation. Uh, autrement, on aura du temps à la fin des présentations uh, pour des questions plus générales. So, certain presentations um, that require the questions will have them after those questions, but uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time set aside for uh, more general questions. Uh, there are some items that we need to vote on. Uh, so voting will be conducted by clicking on the raised hand icon that appears on the left of the bar in the center of the uh, interface. Uh, donc lors d'un vote, vous n'avez qu'à cliquer sur l'icône de la main levée uh, et on contre les mains. So it's going to take a bit of time to count all the raised hands. Uh, but afterwards, uh, we will ask you to unclick the hands so that it's not uh, automatically raised for the next vote. Donc après le vote, après que les votes sont comptés, uh, vous n'avez qu'à décliquer la main pour uh, au fait baisser la main. Uh, all of the relevant documents for the meeting can be found at paso.com slash AGM 2020. Tous les documents pertinents à l'Assemblée se retrouvent sur notre site à paso.com barre oblique FR barre oblique AGA 2020. Si c'est trop difficile à vous en souvenir, c'est les premiers commentaires dans le chat. The top comments in the chat should be the links to where you can get the documents on our website. Et c'est tout. Merci. Uh, la réunion commence maintenant. Thank you. And the meeting begins. Merci beaucoup, Eric. Um, could I have the next uh, slide with the, with the agenda, please? Sorry, is somebody, somebody clicking for me? Ah, thank you, thank you very much, merci beaucoup. So I will just quickly run through uh, the agenda so everyone understands what uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So, uh, on commence avec l'adoption de l'ordre du jour, uh, la, puis la présentation du comité exécutif, uh, puis résultat du vote, de vote sur le maintien de la présidence à temps plein, uh, l'adoption du compte rendu de l'Assemblée générale annuelle tenue le, le last year, last year's uh, minutes, um, my reports, 
Um, then the report of the executive director. Um, after that, the treasurer's report, the financial report. Um, so the membership report, the adoption of uh, last year's audited financial statements, adoption of the budget uh, 2021. Um, and then we go on to the um, adoption of the strategic plan, um, then the uh, strategic communications plan. Then uh, we'll discuss and hopefully you'll agree to our uh, plan for the uh, re relaunch and reboot of uh, Buda Papier. And then uh, after that, there will be an adopt a chance to ask um, questions on the uh, reports that were, have been distributed. So uh, the report on insurance where we have Dick Ballhorn here with us and then the report on the professional committee. Uh, I'm not sure if there are other reports. Then a chance for uh, questions from from members and uh, members business. And then after that, we will be done in the middle between um, the the uh, executive director's report and the treasurer's report. We'll have a five minute uh, break just to give everybody a chance to to stretch and you know take care of human needs. Um, et uh, la réunion est dans les deux langues, so soyez à l'aise à poser des questions ou faire des commentaires dans la dans la langue de votre choix. So. Um, with that, I will go on to the uh, next item, which is the um, presentation of the executive committee. Um, and that I would like to introduce, we have uh, new members this, this year, uh, CJ Scott um, from our trade stream, Michael Eystone from our political stream and returning members, uh, Suhaila Elkateb, Madeline Johnson and, and me, uh, who's the person chairing here. Uh, and I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Keely Hunter, our MCO member who is not uh, returning. She is off to take care of a very important uh, personal project over the next year uh, and we'll, we will miss her. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Peter Kolakovitz and Kale Husband, who uh, were with us at the beginning, but uh, unfortunately had to leave XCOM uh, during the during the year. And of course, I would like to thank um, all of the people who are going into their second terms, so our second year of their of their terms. Uh, Tam Ames and John Gossel from our trade stream, uh, Marina Frinku, Bao Jantang, Iris Louis and Randy Orr from Immigration, uh, Bronson Borst, our other MCO member, and uh, Emily Alexander and Tanya Bello from our, our FSIA stream. Um, we don't, uh, we, we are missing one MCO member. Uh, we didn't get uh, anyone um, coming forward to nominate from, um, to be nominated from uh, our original call for votes. So I'm wondering, is there anyone out there uh, who would like to stand who, to be nominated from the floor for uh, this vacant MCO position? I'm looking at uh, at people in the the list of participants to see if there is anyone who is uh, who's raising their hand. Any regular members who are our MCOs currently serving in FS positions who are interested in uh, in joining XCOM. Um, we have had an expression of interest from from one MCO who was interested but who is not able to be here today, so can't be nominated from the floor. So um, if there is no one else, I will propose that um, that we that after this meeting, I, I discuss that with this person and we would then um, do our normal thing, which is appoint uh, someone for until the next AGM to serve as the representative of the, of the MCO stream. And if they if they don't um, if they don't, um, if they if they don't want to come back, they don't have to run again. But if they do, they would they would uh, be required to to stand for regular election with the uh, with the um, with the next round. So I'm not seeing anyone. Um, I'm just checking again. Does anyone else anyone else who's looking at the things? Do do you guys see any any hands? I'm not seeing any little hands. So. OK, if that is the is the case, um, I would ask that uh, that we accept this this slate as the um, as our, and well, that you welcome everyone as our uh, 
as our new XCOM minus one MCO for, for the coming year. I'm not seeing any comments in the chat or anything that needs to be discussed about that. So I will move on to the, can we move on to the next slide? Which is the results of the 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 vote on the future of the of the presidency? So happy to see that you guys uh, decided to accept our uh, proposal, um, our recommendation on the vote. We got 357 ballots cast, uh, which represents 20.1% of eligible voters. 85.99% um, of you voted yes. Uh, you didn't want to continue with a full-time president. 14.01% voted no, that's 307 versus 50 people. Um, and then uh, of the yes vote, option A, which was uh, extend the full-time presidency for an additional, or the pilot, pardon me, for an additional year and proceed with an evaluation and a vote next year on permanency carried. Uh, that got 76.4% of the yes votes, uh, 235, which represents 65.83 of the total votes. So. I would ask we need a motion to authorize the executive committee to implement the results of this membership vote since it's actually the AGM that is technically the decision making body on for these kinds of things for PASO. So is there somebody out there who is willing to uh, move uh, a motion along the lines of what I've got up here on the on the slide? If so, please pop up your little your hand. Uh, I see Michael Eystone saying he will so move. Um, and I see who is. Kale Husband says he will second, so that's great. And um, can I say who is in all in favor? If you're in favor, please raise your raise your hand on your on your uh, your screen. I'll put my hand up so people can see what a Raised hand. Can I look, raise my own hand? Yeah. No, I just raised my own hand. So you can see what that looks like. I have a question in the chat, Pam. Can you explain again with the yes vote? Ah, so the yes. So so the um. It's, it's, sorry, the yes vote is to continue for one year and then review. So okay. we're accepting the the result, the vote of the of the. 76.4 people. Uh, oh. <clears throat> the, the votes have been counted. The motion is passed. Um, if everybody could lower their hands. OK, so I'll just check. Does anyone want to register a vote against that motion? Uh, sorry, I'm not. So I see. Oh. I still oh, see no. names coming up. Though. Sorry, I need to lower my own hand. OK, Marina, do you want to vote against the motion or OK? No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so it looks like uh, none opposed. So any abstentions? Do anyone want to register an abstention on that on that vote? I'm not seeing any, so thank you very much. We have our work cut out for us. Um, we will uh, we will work to to implement the the membership vote on 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 that issue. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, our next item is the adoption of the of the minutes. Can we go to the to the next slide? Excellent. So um, is you guys had the minutes in your um, in in your package? Could somebody please um, make a motion to adopt the? The, the minutes of the 2019 AGM. I see Tam Ames moves. Uh, somebody else, Vikin Kunjakian seconds. Um, are there any questions or comments before we go ahead with the vote on the on the minutes uh, that were in your handouts? I'm checking to see if there are any raised hands and I'm not seeing any. Um, nothing in the chat. OK, so all in favor of adopting the, the minutes of the 2019 AGM as presented. Uh, Pam, we have a question in the chat from Mathieu Roy, who has a question about 
the vote to adopt the <clears throat> the vote that was done earlier? So according to our constitution, the AGM is actually the formal decision making body. So I mean, our our vote effectively was like a plebiscite rather than a formal referendum if you know if you want to make that parallel so we're just formally adopting the the decision of the members we just need that for the for the records now if you guys had voted against it we could have been in big trouble but it's it's a, it's a formality just because of the procedures that are that are written in our in our constitution Metcha, does that answer your question I hope so. <laughs> uh, so I'm going back to the vote on the on the minutes. OK, thanks, Mitchell. I'm going back to the vote on the minutes and I'm seeing a bunch of raised hands. So that is good. Uh, is has everyone who wants to vote yes on the minutes had a chance to raise their hand? I think so, looks like. Um, does anyone want to vote against adopting the, the minutes? I'm not seeing any. I'm seeing, okay. Does, uh, Marina, do you want to vote against adopting the minutes? And CJ, no, okay. <laughs> CJ, are you voting against the minutes? Uh, Randy, are you voting against well, them? I, I thought I already raised my hand. I'm not quite sure what happens when I hit that little hand, but. So, OK, so now it says lower my hand, so I must have raised it. Yes, so I think you, you voted in favor of the minutes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep track of who, who's got their hands up. So, OK, so if you can lower your hand and then we're we're all clear. So it sounds like no one wants to vote against the minutes. Anyone want to abstain on the minutes? Ah, oh, OK, so there's a lag in the in the hands. Gotcha. <laughs> OK, so thanks, everybody. Um, and that is is done. So um, thank you very much. The minutes are, are adopted. Um, and then the next item is uh, the president's report, which is which is me. Um, so um, could I have the, the next slide, please? So basically, um, I'm not going to take a, a huge amount of time to give you guys this report because I think we've been spending a lot of time. We've been we've been trying to communicate uh, as regularly as we can with uh, what now biweekly regular updates on on all of the various things that uh, that we've been doing, and also a number of the items that we've been working on will be dealt with in the other agenda items on the strategic plan and so on. So. I'm going to go through this, uh, make this report fairly brief. Um, but basically, you know, since uh, March, a huge amount of our time has been taken up uh, dealing with the uh, the COVID-19 uh, situation. And, you know, I have to say that we are really in an unprecedented situation. It's uh, every day we're discovering something that, um, you know, that we just have not have not foreseen or some way that our our lives have have been changed by all this in in a way that we uh, that we just could not anticipate before. So, I mean, you know, just a few numbers. Um, last week we um, we had our our fiftieth um, national joint council task force meetings with the uh, the presidents of the bargaining agents and uh, our uh, treasury board and employer counterparts. We were meeting weekly for the first uh, two or three months of the crisis. Now we're meeting biweekly. And we expect that that will continue. And we found that to really be an invaluable forum for um, for raising issues and and you know getting attention from our our departments, IRCC and and, and global affairs on issues as as we need them. In addition to our regular task force meetings with with the individual departments. Um, yeah, we've had more than uh, than uh, 25 formal meetings with with those departments on on different issues. Um, we have been steadily engaged in crisis communications. My my um, weekly and now biweekly messages to everyone. We've had a couple of town halls. We've had meetings with various uh, you know subgroups of of members who uh, who are have different uh, different issues to discuss. 
So that's been taking up a, a lot of a lot of time and, and energy and work from the PASO office. We've been uh, heavily engaged in advocacy on your behalf on the FSD 64 issue in particular, uh, the repatriations of, of staff from from uh, missions to headquarters and then subsequently the return issues and the questions of medical evaluations, returns of dependents, um, all of these various things. We're still working uh, on, on dealing with um, the questions of travel for people at post. Um, FSD 5051 R&R, we're going to have a meeting on, on that next week, or sorry, pardon me, tomorrow with, um, with Global Affairs. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to get some traction on, on policies that make a bit more sense on that. Our occupational health and safety issues have really, um, you know, become a very serious thing. And I want to give a shout out in particular to, uh, to Sahila Elkatab and Randy Orr, who have been our leads. Uh, on these issues at, at uh, Global Affairs and IRCC respectively, because you know these um, OSH issues have really been kind of a, um, a a simmering thing for a long time. We only just in this last collective agreement, PAFSO finally has a health and safety clause in our in our agreement. We never had one before. And you know we we didn't realize that we were we were a bit psychic in recognizing that we were going to need this kind of thing so badly. So, OSH issues have suddenly been uh, front and center in in managing the the COVID nineteen situation, and they have really been doing yeoman's work and and uh, and fighting for for what everyone everyone needs to be safe in the in the workplace. Um, we've also been dealing with the question of six nine nine leave. That's the leave for other purposes. That is helping people, you know, parents and people who have had uh, have been unable to work due to the the knock on effects of of COVID nineteen. Um, I uh, 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 we're we're again going to see probably some changes on that, but um, you know we've succeeded with the other bargaining agents in coming up with a policy that I think will will allow that leave to continue to be available to more most of the people who will who will will need it um you know we've also been dealing with issues on remote work and how that how that plays out for for people um, under these circumstances you know the bottom line as i've said is that our systems have just not been designed to deal with this and so everyone has been pivoting and i've been super impressed with the way the executive committee and the paso office have have managed to adapt to what they've had had to uh, adapt. I mean, our office has managed to transition seamlessly to remote work thanks to Kim and some of the changes and modernizations that she had made uh, before all of this happened. Um, you know, I expect that we are going to be continuing to deal with this situation for quite a while. Uh, you know, I don't want to scare people, but you know, the government is writing some pretty big checks and there have been some pretty profound impacts on you know not just on the public service and our own departments but on the country as a whole and we do not know necessarily what's going to come down the pike to deal with all of those so i expect that we will be a um a continued um you know this is going to be a continued focus for for the, the entire paso team uh for some time to come um could i have the the next slide please Sorry, I just lost my 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 screen. So the other issues that we've been dealing with, despite uh, you know being being caught up largely with with a lot of this, is we we have um, delivered to you the strategic plan that we promised last year after you adopted the strategic review. And I'm not going to go into that um, because um, there's a there's a separate agenda item on on that. Um, we we're also continuing to work on our governance uh, situation. Uh, we've adopted uh, terms of, of reference and a uh, code of conduct for the executive committee that we didn't have before. Um, we're continuing to work on um, our, you know, better data and establishing, uh, you know, positive systems for for tracking uh, members and, and membership information and all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, we have our ongoing advocacy and communications um, activities. 
I've mentioned the occupational health and safety issues, which are not entirely COVID related all the time, although that's been the, the big thing. And you know, then there's the ongoing issues of uh, recruitment and various competitions and other HR issues at, at Global Affairs and, and IRC, C, IRCC that we continue to, to, uh, to work on and that we'll, we'll talk about through the, the rest of this meeting. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm not seeing is are there any questions or anything from the from the the chat that uh, that need uh, need comments? I see somebody's pointing out that they can hear my dog snoring. Yes, I'm glad that you recognize that as a dog snoring and not some other you know brood grumbling that's coming from uh, from behind the behind the screen here in my uh, in my my house. Just for anyone who'd. Uh, Who'd like to meet him? This is uh, this is Squiggy. He and his brother just turned thirteen, and they are very happy to to be at this at this meeting. Um, I'm just looking at the at the chat. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions on on this. We will have a chance to discuss more general issues when we get to the um, to the the end of the of the meeting so if everyone is ready i will turn over the um the floor to uh kim to do her executive director's report hi everybody uh, bonjour tout le monde uh, 2020 has been a year for the history books uh at paso it's been a year challenges growth and introspection on our programs and services and how we can better deliver them to you our members in February at the XCOM retreat, we started the work on developing PASO's strategic plan. This work continued throughout the winter and spring with consultations and input gathered by all stakeholders to bring us to the final product being presented along with the comms plan for your approval today that Pam is referenced in her report. The same month, XCOM made the difficult but necessary decision to put the publication of Bou de Papier on hiatus. This downtime has allowed for a task force committee to undertake a complete review of the magazine and to develop a plan to reinvigorate it, extend its reach and to increase the readership. During this process, subscribers and advertisers were notified of the hiatus and reimbursed for prepaid ads or any issues still outstanding. As a member of the task force, I can report that I'm very pleased to see such a high level of engagement among my fellow committee members. Over our feeling about the future of the magazine. The president, as Pam has mentioned, will be providing a full report on the committee's work uh, later today in the meeting. In February, also in February, the first few months, of, <laughs> if, if the rest of the year went really quick, the first few months we got a lot of stuff in before COVID happened. Uh, in late February, our finance officer un unfortunately went off uh, unexpectedly on extended leave. And this coupled with the extended absence of our long-term uh, director of administration, uh, we had to look at doing uh, processes to help backfill for those two positions. And we're pleased to report that we have a term administrative assistant hired, Marty Johnson, who is on the call today and providing assistance on this meeting, and a contract finance officer, Jeff Beard. And in true 2020 style, no sooner had they joined our team than COVID-19 work from home orders came down and all operations had to go virtual, as Pam has mentioned. Uh, thankfully, though, in late 2018, we spent a lot of time and effort to implement business continuity measures, which included the upgrade of our IT systems, both the software and hardware, as a voice over internet protocol phone system. This made the move to working remotely almost seamless. Staff were so quick to adapt and to make the necessary adjustments required to be able to continue the work from home offices. I'm pleased to report this done. This work was done without impacting the availability, delivery and quality of representation, communications and other secretariat services to the membership. With all the upheaval and uncertainty caused by the global pandemic, we have seen a significant increase in the number of members reaching out to us for guidance and advice on various labor relations and FSD related issues. In response, we have held two town hall meetings with members to better understand the impacts of COVID-19 and the impacts it had on their work and to explore which systemic issues to bring to the attention of management. What we discovered through these sessions is that the biggest issue facing our members centers around vulnerable health status declarations. 
We undertook to push back on the employer's proposed processes and were successful in ensuring that those members who had been declared vulnerable would be assessed by a medical professional and that their fitness to return to post would be determined by that assessment and not from a decision made from management. Over the course of this busy year, our Labour Relations Unit has been able to achieve many positive outcomes for our members. Some notable cases include the reimbursement of relocation expenses, assistance with obtaining authorization for the evacuation of pets from post, uh, in addition to the principal residence and family reunion expenses being paid and authorizations of per diems, temporary accommodation expenses and alternative relocation routing. We had three return to work cases where members were put back on strength while awaiting suitable assignments, along with two successful grievances on PMAs. Two cases were resolved through mediation regarding a harassment complaint and a code of conduct breach. 32 cases were resolved informally regarding general labor relations issues and finally the successful resolution of over 80 long outstanding Phoenix related pay issues. On the finance and administrative side of things, the current situation caused us to move away from check payment and instead move to the electronic transfer of funds for accounts payable. The transition did cause a few delays in getting out invoices to some of our affiliate members. We had to wait until some of the COVID-19 restrictions list lifted in order for us to access the office so that we can mail them out. I like patience and understanding through the Another consequence of the pandemic was a decision of the FS Awards Committee to put off the gala until 2021. The committee is currently reviewing options to do a virtual awards gala in, 20, in 2021 or whether to see if they might delay it to 2022. This summer, we focused our energies on revamping and reconfiguring our entire membership database. These long overdue improvements will allow us greater efficiencies in updating our records, accessing vital information and preparing reports. For our group life insurance policyholders, we also have undertaken a project to enable them to, view, to register and view their policy information through GroupNet, the Canada Life web portal. And finally, we're about to send out our latest issue of the Bout de Papier. This was the issue that was done before the, the hiatus started, uh, along with our much coveted uh, PAFSO calendars. Due to the many uh, sudden um, evacuations and delays in the, in the posting, we may not have all of our members' current mailing addresses. In order to make sure that these magazines and calendars get where they need to go, we are asking you, our members, to let us know of any change in your contact information. So if you haven't already done so, please send your mailing address to info at paso.com. As we move into the final months of 2020 and into the start of 2021, please be assured that PASO remains committed to ensure your rights are upheld and protected. We recognize and appreciate all the hard work and sacrifices that you have made this year. By working together as a collective, I am confident we'll come through this turbulent time stronger and we will have highlighted the crucial role that you, the Foreign Service Officers, play in the service of Canada and all Canadians at home and around the world. So take care, be safe. Thank you, everybody. Back to you, Pam. Thank you, Kim. Um, I, I, there, that's definitely a lot of work that has been done by by you and the other members of the of the PASO office, and I, I really hope that you uh, that you recognize you understand how much we appreciate everything that all of you have done and the the flexibility and adaptability that has has been shown by by the office team. Um, it's really been it's been impressive, and it's been it's been a pleasure to to watch and to to work with a group that has been. Uh, that has been been responding to uh, to a challenge in in such a way. Squiggy Squiggy appreciates this too. Um, I noticed that we have on 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 the agenda. I had had a five minute pause built in here, but we're actually ahead. We're only at um, at. Uh, 436. So perhaps, Randy, if you're okay with that, yeah, uh, what I suggest is that you do your do your treasurer's report, sure. and then we can we can take a break when we're when we're closer to the hour mark. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, okay, my name is Randy Orr. As mentioned, I'm being treasurer of Paso since November. 
of uh, 2019, but some of you may recognize that I have done this position uh, in past uh, uh, in executive boards in the past. I have over the next few minutes an order of discuss of business to cover made up of the following. One, to review the membership report, which was sent out with the invite, to seek approval for the 2019 audited financial statements, and three, to seek approval for the proposed 2021 budget as presented um, and all the financial committee as presented to you from the financial committee of PASO and endorsed by the full executive committee at its last meeting. The membership report, uh, I just wanted to, it's not a vote or anything on this one, it's just a review. Uh, we have seen a slight growth in uh, members um, in the last year. Uh, I just want to get my numbers here. In 2019, we had uh, um, a bargaining unit of 1919, 1,919 members, and a bargaining unit in October of 2020 this year of 1,998. So growth of a few uh, affiliates, uh, associates haven't changed much, three in 2019 to 13 in 2020, and 456 uh, affiliates now five, 106, 514. Sorry, I can't read my own writing sometimes. I just wanted to, um, when I talk about growth though, however, I would like to go back. I went back to um, earlier annual reports that I have from my years past. And I note that in September of 2017, just three years ago, the bargaining unit only comprised 1,547 people. So that is a growth of about over 400 people, and of course, this can be attributed to uh, bringing on um, more uh, MCO and the international development uh, um, people, but we continue to have um, lag times, fairly extensive lag time between the time that we um, know about these people and Treasury Board uh, uh, tells us because of some Phoenix issues, continuing Phoenix issues. Um, so we try to keep as up to date as possible on who our members are, but we rely on uh, sources uh, that are beyond my control or anybody else's control as to when we actually know when people are um, on strength to become members of, um, um, of PASO. Uh, there's no vote on that, as I said. I'm just going to move on now to the uh, Treasurer's report generally. Um, <clears throat> it's already been mentioned by both Pam and Kim, so I don't have to go into great details. Um, but like almost everybody else in Canada, when I took the role of treasurer in November of 1919, of 2019, um, I was completely oblivious to the fact that by March 19, um, when we were sent home from IRCC, which is where I work, and I guess GAC was about the same date, um, that the COVID epidemic would change things so dramatically. And I had no idea, again, at that time, uh, how much impact it would have on my abilities to uh, to work with the other people in the executive and other people on the uh, administrative staff in, in dealing with uh, ongoing uh, issues with financial reports. Um, so it's become a challenge. Uh, it's not as simple as it was. Um, I work off on a laptop now, which is not, I find as comfortable as working with my um, full um, computer. Um, we have. I have no printer at home. I have to go in occasionally to work to print things, which is a, a, a difficulty. And um, of course, no in-person uh, um, meetings except uh, for I think two or three that we had uh, in preparation for the budget for 2021. Uh, and all of this has made it uh, a little more difficult. Um, and and uh, um, I've compensated somewhat by having as much as possible weekly calls with the executive director to make sure that we're on track uh, and that things are going uh, well. Uh, I'm always very cognizant of the fact that I'm dealing with your money and I want to make sure that uh, members always feel that they we get the best value um, for their money and uh, that it's used um, in, a, in, a, in a way that is prudent. Um, and I think we have done that. Um, so it's been an unusual year for PASO, but work has continued on paying all the bills, obviously. Um, 
We did have some uh, hiccups, as uh, mentioned by the executive director, with the loss of uh, um, our accountant for a while and having to hire a contractor uh, to do that job. Um, and also the long-term absence of some people on the uh, on the staff who have uh, in the past been a great source of uh, information about uh, how things operate at PASO. Um, but uh, despite all that, uh, I think, uh, as mentioned, that we continue to provide services to our members and working to keep the budget and preparing a new one for January of 2021 uh, in on track. Uh, there have been more delays than normal um, with a number of uh, issues, and a lot of it has to go back to, of course, everybody's having to work remotely, including our auditors, our accountant, who I've uh, only met in person uh, two occasions. Normally, uh, if this was a normal year, I would have met probably 20 or 30 times uh, personally with them. Um, I'm going to talk about three periods of time. I just wanted to make it clear. We have an audit that covers the year 2019 because our financial year runs January 1 to December 31st. So the last full year that we have an audit is 2019. I'm then going to talk a little bit about 2020, the year we're in now, and then move on to a uh, proposed uh, budget for 2021. I'd like to refer now to the 2019 audited financial statements. Everybody uh, in the invite should have received uh, something that looks like that, but uh, you didn't probably print it off like I did, but uh, um, it's quite a substantial document and I don't uh, think that I really need to uh, uh, go through it uh, line by line. However, our auditor, Mr. Brabant, who uh, unfortunately, although invited, was not able to um, um, attend the meeting to answer any questions, so we can take questions in the chat. And if I need to get back to him about any question uh, with the financial statement for 2019, I can get back to anyone who sends in a question. But he did certify that the audit was completed for 2019, did not find any abnormalities or uh, any areas of concern. Um, and um, the numbers look uh, fairly good. And we did land up with uh, a year of um, uh, ex ex excess of revenues over expenses of over $200,000. At the last executive committee, the, vote, the board proposed a motion to put this surplus into the Job Action Fund. Uh, this will continue um, to do a number of things. One, uh, it covers additional members who have now joined PASO, that's the MCOs and the FIs, so we wanted to make sure that we adequately fund that strike fund. And two, to preserve the expectation that at any job action in the future, uh, that we continue to offer full compensation for loss of salary and FSD uh, expenses uh, for members who are asked to go off work. Um, we're not planning anything. I'm not trying to scare anybody here. Right now. I just want to know that we're uh, taking care of this because we want to make sure that we are always, as a collective bargaining um, uh, collective, uh, ready for any action that we need to take. Uh, if um, Treasury Board comes along with something in the future that we just cannot stomach, such as uh, an attempt a few years ago to change sick leave provisions, totally unacceptable to pass. So we may have to take uh, job action. So we always keep that in the back of our mind that we are a union. And although we don't use this power very often, we always want to make sure that we are prepared uh, and that we we would not have to sit back and go, oh, we'd like to do something and we'd like to take a job action, but we can't because we don't have any money. So we always want to make sure that we uh, continue to uh, um, add to our strike fund um, to make sure that it's adequately um, um, funded. It, it'll, Red, it'll take can some I just, yeah. just jump in? I mean, the job action fund is called job action rather than strike fund for a reason. And that's so that we can yeah. use that money for other activities. Like, for example, if we wanted to launch a, a public awareness campaign of the, the value of the of the FS group, for example, we could we, you know that's the kind of thing that we could that we could do with that money as well. So yeah. it's a very important uh, insurance policy and strategic tool for us to to be able to use. Yeah, I I, I also avoid the word <laughs> that you mentioned uh, and call it job action uh, because uh, in the past we've used it for things such as uh, buttons, t-shirts, uh, 
um, stickers, magnets um, to, to present to um, the employer um, our position on certain things. So yes, I agree with you. I didn't I just didn't want any great detail. So thank you for uh, uh, filling that in. So um, without having to go through the uh, complications of <clears throat> all of the statements uh, that are there, uh, people can review these and look at the reserves um, and how they're uh, presented to you. Uh, there are reserves for the BOO, the FS awards, severance pay. And there's a number of uh, places where we place our money um, so that we always are funded. Um, we don't run a, a budget that collects the money in one year and spends it all. Uh, there's quite a bit of money that uh, is put aside. Um, to make sure that we um, maintain the uh, nonprofit nature, of course, of PASO with Revenue Canada, an audit must be performed, which it is always done uh, every year, and the membership must vote uh, to accept that report. So at this point, uh, on the 2019 audit statement, um, I would like to move to have the audited 2019 report approved by the annual general meeting, and I would need a seconder for that. Uh, so I see that Vikin, Vikin put his hand up. Vikin, were you wanting to second or were you wanting to ask some kind of a question? Well, I'll preempt that by saying if I get a seconder, <laughs> if <laughs> I can, then I will open it up to uh, um, a chat, um, but people can also send in questions after. But um, let's get the motion on the floor, as they say have a seconder, and then it can open to possible discussion. Okay, so I saw Vikan as the Vikan as the first hand as a as a seconder. So unless he, uh, yeah, so he is seconding. Okay, I see in the chat. So um, Randy moves, Vikan Kunjakian seconds. Um, is there any discussion? We're watching the chat for questions. I guess I could could supplement any questions that people might have that. The audit report is done by an auditor um, according to the rules uh, of, the, uh, of the profession in Canada. And this is a presentation that they make and they certify that it's correct. It's not something that I can go back if, if anybody thinks I can go back and change a number. You can't change these things. But we do have to accept that we have received the report and, and approve that we are um, accepting it for the year of 2019. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I it looks like we are ready to to call for the vote. Going once, twice. I'm allowing for a, a lag <laughs> three times. Um, also, all in favor of uh, adopting the the financial statements, audited financial statements. Yeah, Please put up your put up your hand. <clears throat> Good, I'm seeing lots of hands. I guess I'll put up my hand. <laughs> okay, I'm allowing last chance to put up your hands. Going once, twice, three times. Okay, <laughs> I think it's a Commodore song. <laughs> I know, I know. So, any um, uh, if you could please lower lower your hands, those of you who voted in favor, so I can see if there are any uh, any voting against. Looks like or your hand, Pam. Otherwise, you're voting against. Oh <laughs> yes, <laughs> I need to lower my own hand there. <laughs> So is anyone voting against the audited financial statements? Uh, Tanya, I see that I see your hand up. Does that mean that you want to vote against? No, OK, Tanya's hand's gone down. So does anyone any, anyone want to abstain from the audited financial statements? Not seeing anyone. 
Once, twice, three times. Okay, so the audited financial statements are adopted. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so Randy, next, next thing. Sure, I'd move on to um, a brief report about 2020 and of course uh, the um, effect that the pandemic has had on uh, on the uh, financial situation, but generally um, it's, it's very good. Um, uh, the revenues uh, continue to be strong. Uh, we have uh, new members joining uh, this year. Not that they join, but uh, past, uh, Phoenix has finally told us they're on the book, so we can uh, start collecting some dues from them. And um, we seem to be having uh, fewer Phoenix problems this year um, than we had uh, two to three years ago when there were large time periods when we were not receiving uh, our dues. So uh, that's helped. And in fact, um, some past dues have been remitted uh, that were owed to pass so during the year. So we're in a very good situation. And we also in discussion with uh, the Royal Bank who handles our investments, the, they have reported to us and um, I met with them a couple of times that despite economic slowdown uh, due to the pandemic, uh, Paso's portfolio investments and uh, um, and reserves is doing very well, um, considering the situation, they're not losing any money. And uh, we should be very close to the estimated uh, amount of investment income uh, for the year 2020. Um, expenses uh, generally for 2020, um, except for set costs, such as the uh, rent on the office, even if nobody's actually in it, we still pay rent on it. Um, salaries, uh, benefits and so forth that uh, have to be covered. Um, these have all um, uh, been on target and um, we have um, been able to um, meet those. Um, where expenses are gone down is on the association side, of course, because we've had limited events, uh, fewer mail outs, uh, only one boo, uh, fewer professional events. Uh, uh, I appreciate, Pam, that uh, you did try some telephone events, which was very good. Um, it's been more difficult uh, uh, at IRCC to, to have those because of uh, various uh, difficulties of using uh, government facilities at IRCC to have those kind of meetings. But um, it has um, put a dent in uh, what I'd hoped was, was going to be when I started the year in January, uh, a full year of events uh, um, that we would plan, including the professional day. Um, as mentioned already, we only had uh, one boo published this year. Uh, professional Development Day was postponed, so there was no expense there. The FS awards, as already mentioned, were postponed, so there was uh, limited expenses. There was a few startup costs, but um, those were uh, easily covered by the allocation we had. Um, plus, we had fewer in-person uh, executive meetings. So we cut down on costs there because uh, people were all working from home. And... Um, it looks like at this point, uh, I think our revenues over expenditures are about $95,000, which makes sense considering all the events that we didn't participate in. So um, we will probably finish the year in a very good position again, um, and the new executive will have to determine uh, what they want to do with the funds from the uh, surplus, which I'm planning, which I think given there's only two months left, we will have for 2020. No vote on that. That was just a financial update to the members. Uh, um, we'll see um, where the challenges and risks are. I'm going to move on now to uh, proposed budget 2021. So this is the financial year for PASO that will start in January of 2021. Obviously, um, this was a challenge uh, given the remote working situation and the ongoing uh, pandemic restrictions on getting together. Um, I did have two impersonal meetings um, to make sure that we went over line by line uh, to make sure that we covered for uh, inflationary costs, um, increased um, um, budget items for their, those places where we felt that there was some uh, needed extra money. And of course, uh, making sure that uh, we covered uh, increased wages because of salary increases and um, additional costs which we had not had in the past. For those that don't um, um, know, um, the staff at um, PASO has unionized, so we now have to have a provision for bargaining with our own employees. So these are the kind of things you have to always make sure that the budget is uh, up to date, 
that it covers the expenses that you want it to cover uh, and to make sure that you adequately uh, fund uh, your your uh, activities so that we provide the highest level of service possible. We are a service organization to our members and we want to make sure that anything to do with uh, grievances, uh, complaints, uh, collective bargaining issues uh, are covered by our staff and that they have the resources um, to do their job to the best of their abilities. Um, so revenues are steady, investments are good for 2021. Uh, we haven't had any uh, uh, indication of continuing Phoenix problems uh, unless, and I'm holding my breath, they started to test a new pay system, I think in one department so far. So we'll see if they decide that that's a, a flawed system as well, or if they're going to roll it out. And if they roll it out to replace Phoenix, um, we'll, we'll have to see if there's any issues because we had a terrible time about uh, three years ago and or two years ago with um, not getting our money uh, that was due from dues and of course not knowing where our members were uh, and not keeping up on, an, on our membership list be, because Phoenix was so slow uh, in making the transfers, especially for people who transferred to, between departments. It was taking Phoenix, Phoenix uh, almost a year to 18 months just to tell us that somebody had changed into uh, an FS position at GAC or at IRCC. Um, last year, I just want you to note, in case anybody kept track of this, um, there was a motion set by the AGM to move $200,000 from the reserves to the budget to accommodate the expenses of the paid president. We didn't do that this year because we had a vote. So because you approved the vote by, uh, what was the number again, 85.9%, um, that was taken as uh, permission to move that money. So you'll see that in the budget. Um, I won't go into the, the vote as much as Pam did, but uh, basically that didn't, it saved us one more vote because we wouldn't have to take any money out of the reserves. Um, otherwise, the budget as presented to you um, was uh, first approved by the Finance Committee um, of PASO um, and the XCOM uh, then as a whole uh, voted to approve it to present it to uh, the AGM. What are our risks for 2021? Uh, there are a few. So they said uh, numbers look good, but some of the risks are there still. We don't know what the future of the pandemic will hold for us uh, in terms of making sure that we continue to get our dues uh, submitted to us. Uh, we don't know if uh, uh, Treasury Board is going to roll out a, a new pay system, which would potentially cause us issues as the last time uh, they did this. Um, the um, uh, the boo, uh, we're going to hear later uh, a report about the task force up in the air, FS awards up in the air. So you'll see that um, uh, there was no allocation for uh, funding for that because they have reserves and we're hoping that we'll be able to use those reserves um, to cover the cost for this year. And then we will reevaluate for 2022 uh, uh, allocation of money uh, depending on the um, uh, the results of the task force and the FS awards coming to us with a plan for their future. And last one, uh, and I don't want to go into great detail because we are uh, potentially going to court, is there is a litigation against PASO uh, by a past employee uh, which has not been settled. And um, you never know with court cases, uh, it's always is a, a risk that uh, if it doesn't go your way that you'll have to pay um, a settlement. So um, since we don't know what that could possibly be, uh, I just put that out there um, as a risk. Um, so once again, as we did before, um, I'd like to um, move a motion that the uh, 2020 AGM approve the proposed budget for 2021. Uh, we need a seconder. And then after that, if there are any questions or discussion, we can uh, take questions uh, after the motion is seconded. So I see uh, Nicolas Saburen is seconded. So, uh, and Randy or more. And we have a seconder. Uh, are there any discussion? I, I, I've taken up more time than most people. I took up about 20 minutes. So um, I hope that I covered uh, as much as possible the overview. Everybody has all the information sent to them with the invite. So um, go over it. If you see things that you uh, are questioning, like, what is this about the insurance plan? What is that? Why do we get 
money for that? Uh, um, why do we have to pay out money for this or something else? Um, I'm free to uh, um, respond to any request, especially with new members who uh, may um, may have a lot of questions about um, what we do. Um, you know, if you have a question, let's say like, you know, what is donations? Well, Pastels an organization uh, we have, for example, um, uh, been uh, approached very often with um, a request to help uh, other people. Like we recently gave a, uh, a donation to the, oh, I forgot the group now. International, was it Pam, the International Law? Uh, so we, uh, Public Service International. Yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah. so just to say that yeah, you know, they approached us and said help. we helped them and, and we thought given the, the number of lawyers that we have, sorry, Pan, I, I thought I was over, uh, talking over you, sorry. Oh, sorry, so the donation to Public Service International was in response to the Beirut um, explosion and we were asked to support people from another public service union where, um, you know, people had been had been killed and there were families that 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 needed help. So um, we donated, I think, what was it? It was a thousand dollars, I think. Yeah, um, and also to the um, budget. To a, a conference of lawyers and given the significant number of lawyers and that are members of PASTO, we gave a donation for a, a, a seminar uh, on uh, legal issues. So yeah. those are the kind of things that fall under donations, but people don't always know all the details, so I'm open to responding. Um, we are a transparent organization. I hope that people would feel free to question uh, anything just to make sure that they're um, they're sure of what what they're voting on. Um, I, I Randy, do you have to know a question? That we, oh yeah, I, I, sure. Uh, Laurie is asking where would the money come uh, for the settlement regarding the lawsuit? Well, um, if if in the likelihood that uh, a judgment is made against us for court costs or for a settlement, uh, we would probably have to take it out of our general general reserves. We did not allocate. Uh, any money in the current budget um, to settle because we have no idea what's going to happen there. Sorry, Randy, just to follow up though, we do have that liability provisioned. Yeah. So that is shown as a liability in our in our account. So in the the financial statements that you've that you've seen that have been have been audited. So it is accounted for a possible that the amount of the initial offer that we that we made to to settle is accounted for. And so we've we've effectively set that money aside and can't program from that money um, right now. So yeah. it, we haven't we haven't actually paid it out. We're hoping, I mean, we can't get into the details because all of this is uh, is before the courts and, and needs to remain confidential, but we, we you know, you never know for sure how, how lawsuits will go, but I think that we, um, you know, we can reasonably, we would be quite surprised if we ended up having to pay certainly more than, than that, than we originally, than, than the original um, amount. And if we, if, and we may we may end up being being less than what we uh, what we provision, but we do need to pay our own legal fees and and you know we need to have money available for it for that. Yeah, Kim, I we, see have, you, we do Kim, have liability insurance. Kim looking like she might want to uh, chime in on on that. Yeah, Kim? thanks, Pam. So there has been from when we we're doing the budget for 2021 in regards to legal fees, we have budgeted a hundred thousand dollars for that. And if that if the legal fees were under that and there was a settlement going through then that would be basically be able to cover that. Um, but as Pam has mentioned, we do have the reserves that we can go to if it doesn't. Yeah, and we do have liability insurance on the members of the executive committee. So, yeah. uh, but um, I don't want to get into, as Pam said, we don't want to get into any details, but just, I just put that out there that there are certain risks um, for 2021, um, uh, but um, I think we're in a very good position to handle um, anything that's thrown at us for uh, for the next year. Okay, thank you, Randy. Any more questions? Um, yeah, and Keely has pointed out that that's the high end estimate, so that that yes. is uh, the provision given in the budget. So um, we should, you know, we we wanted to be conservative and make sure that we're that we're accounting for a sort of worst case scenario. Um, but as I said, I I I hope that we that we won't experience that. Um, any other questions or or comments for for Randy? On the on the treasurer's report of the the 2021 budget, and if not, um, <laughs> the snoring is getting louder. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, he's he's right 
I, I, I know that financial statements can be boring, but I didn't think I'd even put the dogs to sleep. I didn't. <laughs> well, before he was, that was, he was just doing his normal snorting, snorting stuff, but now he's, he's actually asleep. So <laughs> I kind of don't want to move him. Um, are you ready to move that we, that we adopted? We did. I've already put the motion and it's been seconded. Oh, yeah, sorry, and we seconded, so we're discussion ready. Now, oh. now if, if there's no other discussion, we can go to a vote. Yes. Okay, so is everyone, um, can we uh, all in favor of adopting the uh, 2021 budget? Um, I'm looking to see if okay. I can. Oh, there they are. I see the hands starting now. Okay. I have lost the hands. Now I have, I have. There, there are 31 hands up. 31 hands. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, is there anyone who is, uh, I'll give everybody a chance to put their hand down if they, uh, if they don't, if they're, so that we can, uh, we can see if there's anyone voting against. So please lower your hands if you, uh, if you don't want to vote against. Oh, someone just commented that it went up to 34, so that's good. Yay. While we're waiting for the vote to come in, I just want to make a final comment that, um, uh, as I said before, this is your money, uh, members. Um, we try to um, be as careful with it as possible. But at the same time, I don't want people to think that they're closed out uh, if members. Uh, and I'm always um, looking forward to suggestions such as in the past we've had some suggestions about things that we could fund uh, if people have good ideas um, present them to the board um, we have money allocated for professional uh, activities um, and in the past as uh, i think we did two professional days uh, based on comment from members that uh, they wanted to see more uh, educational uh, um, thing activities um, we also can look at, uh, we've had suggestions for uh, things like uh, professional training, um, training to be part of unions, um, accounting for unions, things like that. So I, put, I just put out there that we're always open to suggestion um, as to um, where we can do uh, with some of the money that's allocated. Um, sometimes I, I think at the end of the year, it's a shame that uh, things like our in-reach budget is not uh, fully used or the uh, professional uh, development uh, funds are not all used. So I, I give that as an open invitation that the executive can be approached uh, through the president probably uh, with ideas and uh, they will be discussed as to see whether we would fund them. You have a question, Randy, from Samantha asking about the difference between inreach and outreach to members. Well, my, my, my sense is this is a bit of a, a, a rough chance, but um, inreach is basically our, our rapporteur the the when we talk to our own members there are costs involved sometimes in translation uh, and that outreach is when we go outside of our members so sometimes uh, we need to go to um, uh, other organizations or members of parliament or others and we're, we're giving outreach uh, about PASO in fact very much of the FS awards is outreach uh, although it's a separate item but just to give an example of what outreach is where we bring in um, people from outside of PASTO and, and tell them who what we are and what we do. And as Pam mentioned in her um, remarks, advocacy is one of the major parts of uh, PASTO's role uh, to make sure that people understand the issues we have uh, with the rotational uh, workforce. We're not workers in Ottawa like everybody else. We have issues with the FSDs. We have issues with, uh, excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> issues on our contract, uh, issues with Treasury Board. And these are outreach activities and um, they as, as well need to be funded because there's costs involved in preparing briefs and translations and things like that. Uh, does that um, differentiate you um, clear? I'm not seeing. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. OK, great. So continuing the vote, does anyone want to vote against the uh, adoption of the of the budget? Uh, I am not seeing any hands. Uh, I see Suhail. Okay, Suhail, you want to vote against the budget? 
Oh, sorry. I'm. I just managed to get on. I thought I was raising my hand to vote in favor of the budget. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. No, no problem. Um, so I'm not seeing anybody voting against the budget. Does anyone want to abstain on the on the budget? Uh, I am again not seeing any hands. Going once, twice. So the 2021 budget right. is carried. Thank you very much. Thank and, you very uh, much. We'll and so working now to implement it. Yes. It's starting so, in January. So I propose that now we take our five minute break um, and it'll really be a precise five minutes to give everybody a chance to to get up and, and stretch and do what needs to be to be done. So we will be back at uh, 517, uh, 17 minutes past uh, past the hour, unless you're in Newfoundland, I guess then it would be 47 minutes past the hour. Um, and uh, we will then go on to discuss the strategic plan. So I suggest you don't log out, that you just um, you know put yourself on mute and and um, put the uh, turn off your video if you have your video on. And I'll see you back here in five minutes. So thanks everyone.
OK, so um, I'm hoping that we've got most people back. Can we move up the slides to the uh, strategic plan slide? Thanks very much. Um, so, um, just to remind everybody uh, the, on the next slide, um, the strategic plan is the next step um, at the flowing out of our strategic review, which was adopted by the AGM last year. Um, and in that strategic review, we adopted uh, our mission, uh, which was to defend the interests of the members of PASO. Um, you can see the whole the whole text of the of the mission on your on your slide. Um, we and then we uh, we also adopted our our, our values, uh, pursuing our mission in a way that reflects Canadian values of equality, diversity, fairness, professionalism, respect, transparency, and good governance. And just because we uh, you know we say we we accept those doesn't shouldn't be taken to mean that we that we reject uh, the other uh, possible values. And then we adopted a, a vision of ourselves as an organization that is. Uh, well governed and uh, and and so on that you can that you can see uh, can can see here. So and then flowing from that um, from that we we adopted three three pillars three strategic priorities, um, which were the promotion and protection of the professional foreign service writ large, um, advocacy and engagement and governance and organizational renewal. And then stemming from those, we developed our, our strategic plan. So um, you've seen the strategic plan. Um, it's it's in your, your, your package. Can we, um, and uh, I'm just gonna run through very quickly the, the main ideas of, of what, uh, what we're proposing to, to adopt. So you'll notice that on some of the slides I have a little green asterisk and that's because on these things uh, like um, the the objectif à court terme pour, pour, pour la promotion et protection du service, um, uh, on a assuré que la filière uh, et AESA soit intégrée bien accueillée. And we've done, we've made quite a few uh, advances on that already. Um, we have a task force chaired by uh, Emily Alexander um, and one of our, our um, FSIA representatives on XCOM with uh, help from uh, Tanya Bello, our, our other FSIA member. And they have made um, quite a few suggestions and taken some, some actions already to help us make sure that, um, that the, the new uh, members from the FSIA are properly uh, integrated. Um, we also want to take advantage of the role of the president, me, as co-champion for uh, uh, psychological well-being at, at uh, Global Affairs, um, a role that's become even more important in, in the COVID times. And then something that we that we added on, um, you know, really in the last little while is we need to continue to analyze the effects of the crisis and, and uh, come up with a, a strategy that will make sure that we highlight the value of our value added by our membership and um i mean i don't mean to you know talk about things in uh, in sort of crass terms and talk about how you know the advantages of, of covid but i mean one thing i do have to say is that as far as uh public service members go public service unions PASO has had a chance in this crisis to really show what we do for canadians and the way that we that we work and what our value is and we want to make sure that that remains front and center and that uh, decision makers and the public remain aware of what we what we bring to the to the table. So over the, the short term, that's from now till the end of 2021. Those are our objectives um, on on that uh, on that area. So could we have the next slide, please? 
Um, medium term, which is deliverable in 2022, although, you know, because all of these are, I'm specifying deliverable because we're going to have to start working on them now. It's just that it's going to take time for them to 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 be done. So it doesn't mean that we're going to be ignoring these issues for, for another year. Um, we're preparing to start a GBA plus analysis of our current collective agreement in uh, in order to get ready for the next round of negotiations. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing a proper assessment of how different groups are affected by by the provisions. And this is going to be something that will be quite interesting and innovative because as far as I know, and I've, I've consulted with my colleagues at the NJC, no other union, um, well, maybe other unions, but certainly no other public sector union in Canada has done that kind of an analysis and taken those things into, into account. Uh, sorry for my coworkers barking at uh, something unknown outside, outside the door. Um, we're also going to do the same with our foreign service directives in preparation for the next uh, cyclical review, and we need to get ready for the, um, the um, uh, next round of the triennial survey and make sure that we capture all of your your views and concerns because the, the triennial survey really is the basis for a lot of our our advocacy um, and and so on for for the for the the next phase. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And so, in the longer term, um, you know, we want to make sure that that this work that we're going to be doing on the GBA plus analyses of these these things. It forms the basis of a comprehensive uh, intersectional strategy for on our issues. We've realized that you know this is something that we need to do more systematically. Um, you know, we, we're also going to develop a, a, a comprehensive strategy based on uh, rights, recourse, and resources uh, in order to make sure that our membership really understands uh, their their rights and uh, and and obligations as well in terms of occupational health and, and safety and the um, psychological well-being at, at work. And we want to make sure that the lessons that we're learning from COVID are properly integrated into that strategy. Um, we're also looking, you know, in more long term at the overall issue of, of health, psychological health and well-being in the workplace and realizing how connected that is to different issues. You know, you can't divorce something like psychological well-being from the issues of, um, you know, promotions and harassment and all of these things that affect how workloads, all these practical things that affect how how we do, you know, how we feel about work and and our overall level of health. I mean, it can't just be about sending links and you know organizing yoga classes and and at lunch and and so on. It needs to really be connected, and we really, you know, we're trying to take some steps already. I mean, some of you took part in our uh, bystander intervention. Um, training needs assessment and our surveys, trying to move the culture at work, uh, how people are treated and how how all of these all of these things are integrated. So can we have our next slide? Our other pillar is the advocacy and engagement uh, piece where, you know, we want to do a, a, a a campaign that shows the value added in particular of our labor relations team and the things that we're doing practical ways that we're helping real members that PASO's got my back was the the tentative um, name for for this campaign and we're hoping that some of you uh, who have come to us might be willing to you know, either in a sort of anonymized way or maybe in a you know, more prominent way, allow us to talk a little bit about what how, ways that we have that we've managed to help and the things that we practical ways that we have managed to make things better for our, our mission. Um, we're doing the rescue and revamp of Bouda Papier. Um, that's a separate agenda item, so I won't go into a, a lot of detail, but you know, it uh, had become clear that we needed to, to take action to make sure that that, that was, was working and you know, get more out of that, that very important uh, item that, that for, for PASO. And again, we're looking at a, our intersectional action plan for these issues that are outside collective bargaining, things like promotions, um, staffing, you know, all of those those kinds of things that are not going to be in a contract, but that are super important to to all of you, and we we understand that. Um, can I have the the next slide? 
on uh, that side in the medium term, uh, you know, another uh, we need to do a campaign on to expand our, our, our network. Um, we need to in preparation for the for the next uh, next round of, of bargaining. Um, we need to increase our media visibility um, and gain public public support. And uh, we want to, you know, we're working on our online communications and our, our, our advocacy on that. And frankly, you know, uh, pushed by COVID, we've, we've already done quite a lot uh, on our digital strategy. And we've, we've, we are learning to do a lot more as we, as we go. I mean, we're going to be uh, partly digitizing Buda Papier. We're already doing things like our, our uh, members meetings and, and so on online. We're recording webinars and seeing people, you know, seeing that those are getting a lot of views and adding, adding value. And we're going to look at more of that kind of, that kind of stuff. Uh, next slide, please. And so in the long term, I mean, we, we need to make, you know, make sure that we've got a network of uh, external uh, supporters, and um, we we want to make sure that that's a little bit more structured and formalized. There has actually been a big development on that, and that is the creation and soon to be announcement of an important um, group of. Uh, recent PAFSO alumni, we don't want to use the word retirees, I'm not sure if they like the word retirees, but you know Roma already exists, right, the Retired head, Heads of Mission Association, now called Am Canada, um, but um, that's really for people who, who left um, the Foreign Service at the Head of Mission level, which leaves out a lot of people, um, and so this group wants to do, um, it's, it's, made, it's made up of um, former PAFSO members, including some very senior people. Dan Livermore has been the um, the um, lead on the um, on on, on uh, organizing it. Gerald Cosette, you'll remember him, former DMA, has been been heavily involved and it's quite a high powered group. And one of their goals is that they want to work more closely with PAFSO on um, you know, supporting our goals and helping us get our, our messages out, sometimes in ways that, you know, might be difficult for serving foreign service officers to, to do. So, um, you know, a lot of them are writing op-eds and opinion pieces and, and so on, and they've already, they're they're about to launch their newsletter in, in the, the coming weeks, and we're looking forward to working, working with them. Um, we also, in the long term, want to make sure, try to engage more with the Canadian Armed Forces, we see a lot of shared interests and opportunities for joint advocacy, but that's something long term because that's quite complicated to reach out to that to that organization, you know, which is so big and figure out where we can make common cause. But that's something we want to pursue. And we would also we also want to have a legislative strategy, especially for the provincial and federal and provincial levels um, to make sure that we're aware of and of, you know, both threats and opportunities on legislation that can that can affect the uh, the Foreign Service. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so our next one in, in the short term, we've been looking at our governance and uh, organizational uh, renewal. We want to make sure that we um, have a proper strategy for recruiting volunteers for the executive committee. Uh, some of you may have noticed that we did an online, we did a webinar, a couple of webinars for people who were interested in joining. We now have a comprehensive information package. I mean, our terms of reference and, and uh, code of conduct are part of those packages that explain to people what their duties are and what their responsibilities are if they join the executive committee. So we're trying to make everything a little, you know, just that little bit more um, structured and coherent and make sure that we, you know, that people understand what they're getting into when they, when they become on a, uh, a, uh, a member of the executive. We're also looking at the, the functions of our office and trying to figure out how to increase our capacity on, uh, on the administrative and, and uh, communication sides. Um, and we need to look at our, our constitution and that will be part of in partly on in fulfillment of the, the, uh, the task that you've just given us on the full-time presidency to come up with, um, figure out how we need to amend the Constitution, what we need to do to uh, implement whatever recommendation uh, we end up getting, we end up making. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Um, on the medium term, uh, we need to, to make sure that we have a comprehensive risk profile and risk, risk tolerance profile and a running risk assessment mechanism. Um, luckily, Kim had already started to do some of this work. And so that was why we have been able to pivot relatively easily as an organization to dealing with the COVID crisis. But we need to have a, a really good look at that over, overall. Um, we need to do a, a look at all of our programming and activities and look at value for money in alignment with our strategic priorities. And we need to develop a comprehensive evaluation framework for the organization that would encompass the staff and the executive committee and all of our, our programs. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, and in the long term, um, you know, we want to make sure that we have a better data uh, system that we can make sure that we're capturing proper data on, our, on all of our membership. I mean, some of you guys might remember last year at this AGM, I had done a little survey of, of uh, people and, and I have to admit that I was a little bit surprised myself to see that members identified, their, like their, of, of the group that responded, there were about 34% that identified as members of more than one uh, employment equity group. And so, you know, this tells us that, I mean, these kinds of intersectional type issues, this is, you know, these are not fringe issues. This is not uh, just a tiny segment of our, our members who are affected by things. And we need that kind of data in a comprehensive way so that we really understand what's going on, what, what your situations are, how things affect you differentially, you know, depending on gender and, you know, family status and all of these, uh, these other things. We have some work to make sure that all of our committees um, have a firm, solid mandates and, and that those are, are understood. We've done quite a bit of work on that already, but we have some more to do and we intend to have that finalized by the end of the strategic uh, plan. And we also want to have a look at all of our member benefits and programs and just make sure that they are, uh, you know, still relevant and that they are giving decent, you know, in terms of the amount of effort um, that we that they're they're giving the returns and everything that that you need in particular you know we're thinking about the the life insurance program does that need to be upgraded revamped changed you know how much time um, is everyone spending on that and is that is that time really um, you know what 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 we need to to see so can I have the the next slide um, so. I would like to uh, make a motion to adopt the strategic plan as presented. Um, if uh, somebody would like to second, is there anybody who, who is willing to second? I see John Gossel, Executive Vice President, is willing to second, so that's great. Um, have, are there any questions before we before we go? Does anybody have any, any questions that... Uh... You have two questions, Pam. Um, okay. First from Logan, what kind of engagement are you getting on social media? Um, so, I mean, we have a Twitter, we have a Twitter account, uh, we have a Facebook page and, and a Facebook group, which is, is internal. Um, I believe, I'm not sure, it's, it, I'm not sure if Tam Ames is on here, maybe she could tell us um, in terms of our, our followers and our, our statistics if if there is any uh, other kind of. Uh... You, you caught me off guard, Logan. I'm uh, <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. I was if you guys should have told me you needed that info. Um, because it's something I seem to be the only one that kind of posts and it's kind of erratic and not very uh, consistent. Um, we have quite a few followers, which isn't bad. Um, our campaigns, which we've done like for Women's Day, for uh, International Development Week, have had pretty good uptake on Twitter. Uh, Facebook is less uh, popular amongst us, and I don't know if that's just because we haven't really pushed it or if it's just the nature of the beast, the kind of group we are maybe doesn't have an appeal to people uh, through Facebook versus other uh, forms of social media. So uh, I'll be honest, we had a lot of things planned in the spring and then COVID came and blew a lot of our plans out of the water. And it seemed a bit frivolous when people were in lockdown and 
and not sure what was happening and losing their jobs to be like, oh, and let's do a post about, you know, the plants in our office or, you know, something kind of light and fluffy, which sometimes we do. Um, so we kind of backed off on some of those programs. But now that this is the new normal, I mean, things are not going to change anytime soon. I hope this fall we can kind of get back into a groove and start coming up with some consistent campaigns to keep keep us out there because that's the whole thing on social media. If you disappear, people forget about you. You have to be always in people's face to see uh, the reactions. So uh, sorry yeah. about the number. I just don't have that off the top of my head. No, I don't either. Eric, Eric is on the line. Eric, do you have any, do you have any light to shed on that in terms of our, are we getting more engagement or less? I mean, I'm, I'm not, um, I feel uh, like we're getting more, but. Hmm? I uh, haven't had really much uh, chance to get any insights on it. I know that uh, for, to answer the question about the Facebook presence, uh, because there is the internal Facebook group, uh, less people are apt to be paying attention to the public facing uh, Facebook page. Um, but whenever we have posted, um, there seems to be, I think we have some very active followers so depending on what we are posting, sometimes that reach is quite amplified by those who are uh, who are following us both on Twitter and on Facebook. OK, I just looked at our Twitter account. We have one thousand four hundred and seventy five followers. Um, that's pretty good. That's up about that's up considerably because we were under a thousand, I think, when we when COVID hit. So we, we've gained a few people who think we're we're interesting, at least on that on that subject. So I guess the bottom line is we'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to talk about this a little bit more under the strategic comms plan item, but we have some we have some work to do. You know, we, this is definitely an area that we can that we can we can build on. And I see there's another question from uh, Joseph Law about uh, what do we mean by areas of shared strategic interests? So, you know, they're posted abroad, same as us, right? And they're also, um, you know, ser we're also serving, we're more and more foreign service officers, perhaps not, not at this moment, but, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, it's become, you know, much more common for um, foreign service officers to be serving with alongside military as political advisors and, you know, in provincial reconstruction teams and, and so on, and facing you know some of the same serious issues of PTSD, injuries on duty, you know all of these kinds of things, and um, you know there's also issues of family relocation and so on. So uh, taxation. Um, so you know we think that it it will be worth sitting down uh, with uh, members from from CAF and trying to figure out where there are areas that that we can work together. What exactly those are specifically, um, it really does kind of remain to be seen. And, you know, it may turn out that there are not as many as as sort of instinctively we might think, but we think that this is this is an area that's been talked about for a long time that we haven't actually sort of devoted a lot of specific time and energy to you know making a priority. And we think that it's uh, it'll it's worth it's going to be worth looking into that. Um, I hope that that answers your question. I see you've got your thumb up already for uh, for for something else. So I'll if I see your if I see it go down, I'll assume that I, I have not answered your question. I'm seeing it stay there, so this is good. So um, ah, okay, all good. So, uh, so I'm sorry. So John, I moved, and John Gossel seconded. Um, if there are no other comments, I would propose that we we go to the vote on uh, adopting the strategic plan. I see. Okay, I see all in favor. So I'm I'm seeing your hands. Some hands go up. This is good. Anybody else want to put your hand up to adopt the strategic plan? Going once, twice, three times. Okay, 
So it looks to me like the strategic plan is in good shape. <laughs> it's, uh, and I'll ask you to put your hands down just so that uh, so that we can see if anyone is opposed. So is anybody opposed to the strategic plan? Keely and Marina, I see you have your hands up to oppose. So if you, okay, I see Keely's hands gone down. Marina, do you, do you want to oppose the strate strategic plan? I suspect not, but. Sorry, Pam. No, I'm still learning how to use this thing. <laughs> OK, so um, thank you. I will. OK, so it looks like like no one is opposed. Does anybody want to abstain? From the strategic plan? No abstentions. OK, thank you very much. That's carried. Um, so we'll move on to the next item, which is the uh, strategic comms plan. So um, this one, um, I, I won't, I'll go through this one pretty, pretty quickly. Um, this was drawn from the strategic review and the strategic plan. We adopted the, this approach in May. We consulted with members over the summer, so a number of people uh, had a chance to contribute. Um, it's a working document. Like you'll see, it's presented really in the form of a workbook with a bunch of uh, you know questions and so on that we will that we will continue to answer as we as we go on. So. Um, what I'm what I'm asking is uh, the move that the that the AGM endorse the approach and activities outlined in the document as tabled. Um, does anybody have any questions or or comments that they want to put in the in the chat that we could answer? This is another first for PAFSO along with our strategic review and our our overall strategic plan. I don't think we've ever had a formal uh, strategic comms plan before. So I'm not seeing any any chat questions or any raised hands. So um, is somebody willing to move? Tam, do you want to move that the AGM endorsed the approach? Tam moves. And then uh, oh, I see Kale second. Uh, Kale, are you willing to second? I see you were willing to move, so I'm assuming you're, he will second. So um, does anyone have any any questions before we go to the vote? OK, who is in favor of the adopting the strategic comms plan? OK. I'm seeing lots of hands. Anyone anyone didn't have a chance to put up their hand? Going once, twice, three times. OK, so could you put your hands down and we'll see if anyone is willing is wanting to vote against. OK, so anybody want to vote against voting against the strategic comms plan? I'm not sure what Squiggy's opinion is of all this, if this means anything or not. OK, uh, none opposed. Anyone, any abstentions? I'm not seeing any, so the motion is carried. So thanks. Could we go to the to the next slide? So this is the, on the, the one on the relaunch of uh, Buda Papier. 
So we, um, as Randy mentioned, we did not have, we only had one issue of Bout de Papier uh, for, for this year. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. There are a lot of moving pieces on on something like this. We unfortunately lost um, Deborah Hulley um, has been on on long term medical leave, and she was really you know driving force behind Boo and getting getting everything together. But um, you know, the fact is that that we the executive committee we took a look at this and we realized that you know we needed to. Um, take action to make sure that this PASO institution uh, continued and, and continued to publish. Uh, you know, we had sold, uh, we had advertisers who had bought advertising from us. We had subscribers and members who, you know, were looking for the magazine and we realized that we needed to uh, breathe some, some more life into it so that, uh, that it could continue. And so we formed a task force um, back over the summertime, and a number of, of you uh, contributed to, to that, to the discussions. We also included um, some Roma members um, and some of the long-term contributors to, to Boo for their, their corporate memory. And um, we, uh, you know, we had a long series, a series of discussions where we really went kind of back to first principles on what the magazine should look like. So the uh, our, our documents are, are in your, your package. Um, this is still, you know, in the in the the uh, level of, of an approach as opposed to, you know, an extremely detailed plan, but we're looking for your endorsement of that approach. So the key elements are that we would have uh, both uh, digital and printed versions. For, for the for the time the time being we would have two articles uh, that are that appear online um, in the the digital version of the of the magazine at, at the launch we'll do three issues per year um, in the, at, and uh, and we will approve a, a production uh, schedule um, up, up front um, we hope to uh, start uh, producing that issue at the beginning of January 2021. Um, you know, and we, we're hoping to have the issue out uh, in, in March, but some of that is going to have to be determined by the uh, by the people, um, you know, by the by the board, the editorial board and the and the editor in chief uh, to see what what is possible. Eventually, we would like to include other digital elements like we would like to have perhaps a a running blog, you know, that had shorter pieces, things like a podcast, maybe, you know, there's all kinds of different possibilities once we have a chance to see how it how it goes. But initially we will do a print version and and, uh, and with this digital digital component. Um, one of the big changes is that we are proposing to offer modest payment for articles and also to open for contribution from freelancers. Um, and other members of the broad foreign service uh, community like so, you know, um, colleagues from other departments, you know, colleagues from the military, people who've served abroad or, you know, to freelance writers who are writing on topics that are of interest to us, because one of the one of the problems that uh, that came up was, you know, a number of people um, with you know, very high hopes for what they could do in terms of an article, uh, just, you know, not ultimately ending up submitting and, and you know, our editors being being in trouble because they had planned an, an issue around two or three articles that that never materialized, which is a hard thing when you're when you're dealing with volunteers. I mean, we appreciate that people get busy, but we also have commitments to people who are expecting this uh, this publication. We're going to use the same um, the same um, budget We're, we've asked for the same same budget you've approved for 2021 the same amount of money as as last year and the fact that we're now moving you know we're going to commit to three issues rather than four will give us that budget for this uh, small you know small payment for for freelancers so could i have the, the next slide please um one of the other key elements is on the governance side so you know what had happened before was that uh, it had really gotten a little bit unclear in terms of who was responsible or who was not necessarily who was responsible for the boo for boo and the board but who were they responsible to 
Um, initially, I had understood myself that um, that the Boob editorial board was set up independently from PASO, that it was, uh, you know, got got a budget and and sort of operated under the auspices of PASO, but that it was it was constituted separately. And when we started to dig into this, when we realized that you know we had outstanding uh, debts, basically to commitments to advertisers and so on, we realized that no, in fact, it's actually, you know, it's all, it's a subcommittee of PAFSO. And so PAFSO is responsible for the commitments that are that are made. And, you know, theoretically, if an advertiser had decided to sue us or something like that, like it would have been PAFSO executive committee that was on the hook. So we've now uh, proposed to make it very explicit. Uh, we're going to reconstitute the board as the governance and editorial board, and it will be explicitly responsible to the PAFSO executive committee. The director of communications uh, we propose is the chair of that board, and then the editor in chief of the magazine is the vice chair. Uh, the editor in chief position will be open to both associate and affiliate members, so that's to open the door to uh, retirees um, to invite and, and other members of the of the community to to um, who are willing to take on that that uh, that board that that function um, and the editor in chief will be responsible for recruiting and maintaining a diverse board and integrating diverse perspectives so that we don't have uh, you know too too many too much of, of of one of one group or one one perspective on on. Uh, dominating the, the committee. Um, the managing editor will be a clearly defined and designated staff position responsible for the day to day operations and maintaining the production schedule. So there will be, you know, definitely part of somebody's job uh, to do the practical things to get this uh, to get this out. And all of the board members uh, will be subject to PASO's code of conduct and to the fiduciary duties that uh, that come along with that. Um, so could I have the next slide? So what I'm proposing is that uh, to ask you to accepter la proposition de relance de bout de papier tel que présenté. So um, I'm hoping that uh, someone will be willing to, to move that we that we adopt the proposal to do that. I see Tam is moving. Uh, is somebody willing to second? Uh, I see a little hand, but I can't see who that hand belongs to. Suhaila. Suhaila, okay, Suhaila seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and is there any discussion? Uh, does anyone, anyone want, does anyone have any comments or questions on the, on the proposal before we, before we vote? Uh, Keely says, why maintain the paper copy instead of going fully, uh, fully electronic? Um, so one of the questions, one of the, the issues is really that there really is kind of a division among people about who thinks the paper copy is, is useful versus, uh, you know, who thinks, who, who thinks it's, it's not at all. And, you know, we've decided that doing this, um, this kind of hybrid model at first, is a way of testing out what you know what whether or not we should continue with the paper model the going fully digital is a huge change right off the bat um that that would mean that we um that we didn't uh you know that we were losing that 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 advocacy tool that could be distributed when we're you know when we're back in a situation where we can where we can give things out to to members um, it would also, um, you know, probably disappoint a large number of our retired subscribers who, who, you know, are much more comfortable uh, with a paper thing. So, you know, this doing this hybrid model at first is uh, is a bit of an experiment to see how that goes. Um, does anybody else have any any questions or or comments that they would like us to address before we before we go ahead? Um, so, okay, so I'm not seeing any, so uh, I'll call for the, for the vote. So, uh, all in favor of the, uh, of adopting the proposition on the revitalization of Bouda Papier? I see many hands. This is good.
Good, lots of hands. OK, so thank you everyone. Um, looks like that that people people are happy with that. <laughs> That's good. Uh, again, I'll just ask you uh, going if anybody else wants to put up their hand. Going once. Twice and three times. Um, OK, uh, then I will ask you guys to put down your hands who voted in favor and see if anyone wants to vote against the proposition on the, uh, the, the motion on the on Buda Papier. I'm not seeing. So I'm not seeing any opposed. Going once, twice, three times. Um, does anyone want to abstain from that motion? Uh, Randy, you want to abstain? OK, Iris, John, abstain. OK, so three abstentions. John Gossel, uh, Iris, uh, Louis, and uh, Randy Orr, and Pearl Winnega. OK, four abstentions. Um, so the motion is carried. Thank you very much to everyone for for that. And uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So now this is the uh, questions on the report. So I'll turn over the floor to uh, Dick Ballhorn, who is with the uh, insurance committee and ask him if he would like to speak to the report that was that he is. Uh, that, that, that's in your that's in your package. Dick, would you would you like to like to talk? Yes, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, yes, the insurance report is a nice, succinct one. As always, we are looking to uh, add numbers to our insurance program because obviously the more people we have, the better rates we can give. It is the one of the programs that is uh, where the affiliate members are very important to us. Almost half of the people that have insurance are affiliate members. The other thing is just to make sure in light of, uh, you know, making uh, the value for money is that we basically the, the cost of running the insurance program is paid by the, the insurance program. It's not something that comes out of the general budget of, of PAFSO. So it's, uh, it's in that way it's self-sustaining. It is not a, a drain on PAFSO resources. Uh, I guess one of the, the, the new things uh, that's happening is, that, is a chance now to electronically access your insurance policy, which is uh, I think useful for those who have a question about what, what, what insurance do I really have here? And you can go and electronically uh, look it up through the Canada Life uh, uh, website. I guess uh, our, our uh, Marty Johnson can tell you more about that in, in the sense of how easy it is to access it. Um, the, uh, I, I think we, we haven't been able to really meet as a, as a committee uh, in, in, in the, this current year. And we also had, I think, uh, ideas of maybe doing some promotion within the department on, you know, especially with uh, newer members, uh, about the value of the insurance program. Uh, hopefully we can get back to that at some point in time, uh, whenever pan pandemic is over, uh, and, and we can actually do a bit more, be more visible among, among the members. Uh, it is a it's a quieter year for uh, for the program is because we're not it's not a year in which we have to do uh, any rebates and we're not having to make a decision on a new insurance program. Though I, I understand there are still some rebate payments that are still haven't been paid out because of the uh, sometimes the challenge of finding where members are, particularly affiliate ones. Uh, I can't say much more than that. Uh, it's I think it's it, the insurance program continues to offer I think good value to. Uh, to members, the picture of those going abroad with an insurance program that takes account their their a different lifestyle that they have by coming being out of the country and in so many different countries and coming back to Canada. I'll leave it at that. I, I, actually, um, I just wanted to make one clarification that the actual going on to GroupNet as an initiative we're just looking at doing. It's looking not at right. it. But eventually, this is to get there, so you could actually see your own program, your own insurance program. Policy. That's the understanding. Yes, yes. We're currently looking to get that initiative started, so it's it's premature yet for anybody to go in and try to find it. Okay, my mistake. That now. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's coming. Okay. Thanks. It's coming. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> Excellent. 
Yes, yeah, so all of our all this digitization. This is great. <laughs> it's like you can do everything in front of a screen these days. Well, you don't have to get out of your house. You'll always be at home. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Dick, and thank you for, for again for joining us for this whole meeting and and listening to to all of this. We appreciate we appreciate your commitment. <laughs> so, no, no problem. Thanks. So, does anyone have any questions for for Dick or for uh, for the on the professional committee report or the any of the other the other documents? Randy, I see you have your hand up. Do you? Does that mean you want to speak or is that from before? Oh, okay. Randy's hand is down, so I guess that was from before. So, anyone, uh, please feel free type in your questions in the chat. If you have any. I think I was muted. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, Dick, uh, I know we haven't had a chance because of the remote uh, working, but uh, as a member of the very small um, uh, insurance committee, we should uh, have a meeting soon. <laughs> I agree. I agree. To talk about some of the things that you just mentioned about the uh, access to uh, a lot of electronic digitization and uh, uh, and yet again, another recruitment campaign. Yes, sounds like a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it's uh, trying to figure out how to when and how to meet is a is a uh, always a bit of a, a a challenge in in these times. I feel yeah. like I'm using that. Well, I put something in my agenda book to make sure we had to do something before the next executive. Excellent. No, thank you very much. So. OK, so I'm not seeing any any questions. Marty, is there any questions in the in the chat that I that I might have missed or? No, nope, we're good. OK, so I think uh, that leads us to our last item, which is uh, members business and uh, and uh, questions from the floor. So uh, <laughs> is there any can we go to that that uh, next slide and are there is there any does anyone have any any motions from the floor? Any any business that you would uh, like to raise? I don't have anything, but I was I was wondering if maybe John wanted to spend a few minutes on the uh, anti-racism things that he's been uh, um, working on in terms of getting Paso involved with the departments on that. That sounds good, John. Do you want to do you want to talk? And then I see Vicken has his hand up next, so. Um, John, did you want to say a few words about that? Uh, hi, all. Um, uh, for those who don't know, I was uh, recently elected the chair of the Visible Minorities Network at the department. Uh, and, and prior to that, I've been the vice chair um, for the last couple of years and have been involved in the Visible Minorities Network for uh, quite a while now, um, probably about the same amount of time as I've been involved with PASO, so since about 2015, 2016. Um, uh, and and when all these issues came out uh, in this in this difficult year that we've had, uh, I had also taken on the responsibility of uh, looking after visible minority issues in at uh, PASO. Um, but to look at cooperation between PASO and the Visible Minorities Network, uh, it'll be a bit of a conflict of interest if I'm holding both positions. Um, so I will be standing down and, uh, and hoping that a member will step up and take over that. Uh, liaison role uh, in the next XCOM. Uh, but the, some of the things that we're working on, in fact, Pam's been working a lot on it, is on uh, bystander intervention training. And that's something that uh, the Visible Minorities Network, the department and PASO have been working on jointly. And one of the other things that we're looking at is uh, increasing cooperation between PASO and the Visible Minorities Network, because we know there's a lot of members who are uh, members of both groups. Uh, again, it comes down to that intersectionality issue. Uh, and so we really want, uh, we're, um, I can say that on the visible minority side, we're really looking forward to working with PASO. This is an issue I've raised with the other members of the steering committee there. And what we're looking at is practical ways of cooperation because there are certain things that we just can't do, uh, even if we are a, um, a group at, PASO, at, sorry, at, at Global Affairs and also at IRCC. Um, uh, is, is, you know, we want to increase cooperation between IRC, GAC, and then PASO, because I, I think that's where PASO can play a good link, because it's hard for us to have uh, a link at, uh, with IRCC from the GAC side. Uh, and then there's other things that uh, I, 
uh, that we can look at because you know we, Paso can do certain things that uh, the visual minorities network just can't do. Uh, you know, we're all employees, and we all know what can happen if employees, uh, shall we say, uh, get out ahead of senior management. And so, um, you know, we're looking at ways of, of where, you know, we've had members basically express fear that if they work too much on this issue, push issues that they're worried about possible retaliation or other things from managers, because if um, uh, I'd like to say for the most part, it's been pretty good, but we have had the odd situation uh, where it's been reported to us that managers have used uh, openly racist language and, and been derogatory to certain uh, ethnic groups uh, or rural minority groups. Uh, which, considering all the things going on, is quite shocking. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not something where, as the visible minorities now, for example, we could raise that as a grievance. So that's something that they would have to work with, um, members would have to work with their, the union that represents them on. Um, so that's just to give you a bit of a, a, an overview, because it really is sort of the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I could go on and on on various things that we could work together on. Um, but if you do have questions or comments, please uh, do reach out to me. Uh, and, I'd be, and if we find out that there's more, you know, and I'm happy to put out responses on the PASO webpage as well. So if uh, other members have uh, the same question or we're just wondering what's going on, I could put responses there, including uh, responding to you as an individual as well. Uh, and then the same thing, if uh, there are of you who are not members of the Visible Minorities Network, I encourage you to join. Uh, and uh, but you know again we represent all visible minority visible minorities of the department whether you're members or not and so it's like the union whether you want to be represented or not we'll represent you. Uh, thanks, Pam. Thanks, John. Uh, I see that there was a question: Is IRCC involved in the in the uh, bystander intervention training? Um, they are not formally the the the. People paying for the second half are are out of GAC, but um, that group at, at at GAC is connected to the, their counterparts at IRCC, and also there were IRCC members who participated in the initial uh, focus groups and in the and in the survey. So um, we're we're going to make sure that um, that this training is is available to to everyone and that we get everybody's uh, everybody's contribution. But we, I know that um, for the next uh, for the next phase of, of this, we would really like to see if we can connect more more directly to someone at IRCC and see if uh, if we can make sure that that training is is run is run there. Um, is there anybody anybody else? Any other comments uh, before I turn to uh, Vic? Kin? are you still here? Yep. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. So just to point out that, uh, like many people, I've obviously been working from home, and one of the things I didn't realize is that, of course, the desk and the, and the uh, sort of laptop slash keyboard setup is not the same. So my physio and massage contingent has been a bit bigger than previous years. Uh, so just to point out that, you know, when you're having OSH discussions in future, so sort of keep that in mind to see if there's any way of getting a little bit more to, you know, help us get our bodies a little bit better into, into uh, you know, uh, shape. Uh, after spending time on uh, bad chairs and bad desks and bad keyboards. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's something that is going to is going to come up um, like overall federally, you know, with uh, in terms of the healthcare plan and what uh, what's going to be claimable and, and, and what's uh, what's not in terms of equipment. I mean, I do know that both uh, both GAC and IRCC have been sending out ergonomic equipment to people at home. So that's something that you can ask for through your through your department, and I understand that they've you know that they've um, they've delivered already quite a lot of equipment. So all all of that uh, all of that those issues can can uh, can be brought back there. And also the there's the whole issue of whether we're going to be able to claim for expenses related to the home or to our home offices. On our taxes, right, and that's an overall thing, not just for the federal public service, but for for Canada. CRA is looking at what's going to be, you know, whether people who have been sent sent to work from home because of COVID will be able to claim that um, those tax credits that are that are normally, you know, for freelancers and or people who have who whose employment agreement with their their employer formally asked them to work from home. And we're we're waiting for a decision. They keep uh, they keep saying they're working on it. They're working on it. They're working on it. And ACFO, the accountants, has been um, 
has been, um, you know, trying to uh, trying to get a, to get an answer uh, for that. Um, so I see a question from I've raised serious issues with the administration of the health care plan by Alliance Abroad and how those of us abroad are disadvantaged by the way, the way that we manage it. Can PASO not take a more active role in advocating for members on this? Well, we already do take an active role in advocating for members on, on this, but the bottom line is that, you know, it really is, it's a private company and it is administered um, by the employer. So our capacity to intervene directly is quite limited. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll turn over to, I'll ask Kim to, to talk a little bit more about that. I know that that the office has worked with a few people on several several different uh, different issues and, and, and has had had some success. So maybe uh, Kim, do you want to speak a little bit more about about that and if you have any well, advice for people? Mm. Okay, thanks, Pam. Uh, it's not been so much on the individual circumstances, but as a whole in regards to the has evolved with people still at posting. And we brought that uh, through to the National Joint Council with other bargaining agents to push back on Treasury Board. And they then were able to get some extensions and whatnot to happen through the um, through the insurance carrier, like no longer needing um, for a while there, they no longer needed referrals from doctors and uh, and whatnot. So we're using that's an avenue we can bring forth. But like as Pam has mentioned, it's very difficult because it is a, a, a an agreement that um, that the employer uh, administers opportunities present when they're looking at negotiations, which that has already happened. There was a call out. We provided input on that. Um, but uh, the National Joint Council is where we go as a collective to push back and show how it's impacting, especially during this time of uh, of COVID on uh, on the various employees. This is one of those um, those issues that you know come out fall outside collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. That when we say we need to you know to make an action plan and figure out what we can, where we can intervene on them. This is one of the uh, the things. Um, yeah, and I see you're not talking about about adding things to the plan, just administering it fairly. Well, yeah, no, we we agree. And I mean, my advice on to individuals who are having problems with the way the plan is administered is, you know, your first stop should really be your FSD advisor. Um, they're the they're the point of intersection with the 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 insurance companies and they're the ones who should be able to help you um, in getting problems resolved. And you know if you're like if you really are if you're finding problems having um, you know, getting things reimbursed and, and you know, it's it's causing serious difficulties, then please, you know, reach out to the PASO office and, and uh, we can we can get our labor relations team to to see what they can do in terms of of your individual situation. Because, yeah, you know, you you we do. The employer is obligated to provide us with a level of care um, that is that is comparable to what we would get in Canada. And if you know you're not getting fair medical treatment, you're not getting the uh, you know the things that that you need, then that is a that is a serious issue. Um, so yes, uh, are there any any other comments or questions? Anything else anybody would like to raise? I'm uh, I'm not seeing any. Uh, I'm not seeing anybody. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So um, I would uh, I would just like to like to thank everybody, and I'd also like to thank uh, our our uh, colleagues uh, Rick Valois and his team at Collaborate Video, who have been uh, quietly behind the scenes, um, you know, making sure that uh, that everything runs as smoothly as as possible. And uh, yeah, considering that. Uh, that this is an unfamiliar platform still to a lot of us. I think uh, I think this model works really well. And, you know, I think that the the whole uh, doing our, our AGMs and our other meetings on this is something that personally I would like to keep because uh, I think we, you know, we I see I've seen participation. I saw some of you, uh, you know, calling in from Europe and other places. And, you know, I think that it's a it's a good way of making sure that um, that we uh, that we get uh, everybody 
everybody uh, in and, and able to able to attend in bigger bigger numbers than than before. So with that, if there are no final uh, comments, Kim, did you have any last words or Randy? No, I don't know if we need a motion to fend the meeting though. I don't. So we do. I think we do. So yeah. I will move to I will move to adjourn. <laughs> I will second. <laughs> look, for, look for hands. If uh, all in favor of adjourning. Uh, I see many hands. Squiggy is definitely in favor. He was just chewing on a cardboard box waiting for his supper. So thank you everyone. Looks like everyone is in favor. I see no blank hands, nobody opposed. So uh, thank you very much and uh, see you all next year. <laughs> Take care everybody. Take care everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye.